going? Oh, shrink. Okay. Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you are doing well. And it's time for an exclusive interview and conversation with the one and only Lingua Ignota. This is our second interview that we've done with uh, mm -hmm. Miss Hater, but I felt like we needed to uh, catch up again after the release of the fantastic Sinner Get Ready, which dropped this year, and get uh, more info, more background on that, because it really is an incredible release and one of my favorites of the year. Um, so yeah, you know, we're hoping to dive into that and uh, anything else that comes up in the conversation. Uh, first off, how are you doing? Thanks for coming through. Thank you so much for having me again. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, no problem. Round two. Round two. <laughs> round two. You, you survived the first round, so we're, we're, we're going did, again. I did. It was good. It was fun. I enjoyed that talk very much. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hanging in there. I'm alive still. Yeah, how are you? No, I'm doing good. So far, how have you found, like, the reception between you know this new record and your last one to to be has it been uh, a bit warmer more intense different in any way that you've noticed i think people were really surprised by what it ended up sounding like sure. um i think people were um expecting something large and industrial and kind of metallic yeah. and it is not that um but the reception was really wonderful. It was very warm. It was very kind. Um, it was, yeah, um, I, I wasn't, I was expecting and anticipating people to be like, oh, we fucking hate this because it's not like screaming, you know, um, into the abyss, although it is screaming into the abyss, but in a different uh, way. But, um, but yeah, it was, um, the reception has been really wonderful and very, um, enlivening for me yeah yeah um uh, let's talk about you know some of the differences uh that uh, have sort of come up with this new record um the first of which i want to explore is sort of like the religious aspects and spirituality of the album overall and obviously these are like themes that you have dived into pretty clearly in your past work but you know what made you want to lean so hard into that as not just like a side dish but really just sort of like the main focus a main concept for the record this time around yeah, I was, um, it had a lot to do, to do with my kind of life circumstances and where I was living at the time and the situation I was in. Um, I'd moved to central Pennsylvania, kind of remote, like literally kind of in the middle of the state, mm -hmm. um, which I, which was a very different cultural experience for me. And it really was, um, it felt like God's country to me. Um, there's a lot of, um, different kind of sects of Christianity that exist and are really prominent there. And I really started to um, investigate and become really <clears throat> interested in like Amish and Mennonite communities in particular, um, which are, you know, we're literally like neighbors, basically. Um, and so I was exploring that as a way to contend with my own experience and to um, really just look at the concept of higher power um, and explore my own faith uh, because I felt like I was in a, in a really dark place and um, faith was kind of the only thing that saw me through in a way. Although my own relationship to, to God and to faith and to organized religion is super complicated. I can't even really describe it. Um, mm. Like almost lapsed Catholic, but not quite, um, not non-practicing. Uh, I don't know. It's it's very it's it's very complicated. I don't even understand it myself. But again, becoming um, like with Caligula and stuff, there was a lot of Catholic imagery in particular. But in this uh, record, I chose to explore kind of more folky, or not folky, but like folk um, vernacular yeah. religion. Yeah, I mean, there is something about a lot of the tracks on the LP, and even the religiosity of it that feels like very lost in time you know that feels like very kind of archaic feels um you know almost like 1900s america or like earlier like yeah. um you know and, and even as you say like it's a uh, difficult to put your spirituality into words you know you've referred to yourself in interviews as like a semi-practicing catholic and and everything before mm -hmm. um you know, but even if it is difficult to define, would you say there are any definitive ways in which your 
spiritual beliefs or outlook have kind of evolved over the course of creating this record? You know, did that sort of like impact your, you know, overview uh, spiritually in, in some way? Um, that's a good question. I feel like I, um, I feel like I lost all belief in the making of this record. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, yeah, I feel like I started to move like very strongly back into being like fully atheist, um, or agnostic as, as this record was completed. Um, and just, um, and just started to have a relationship with, with the aesthetic components of, of religion as a place to put pain, I guess. Mm. Yeah, Th that's um, interesting that you say that, because, you know, while there are, uh, you know, narratives, I would say that you're concocting on this record for sure. There are a lot of moments where it does seem like, at least through your music, that you're having like some kind of sincere communication with with God in a way. You know, I mean, would you say that that that, that was something that you were engaging with on this record? It was it was. um it was definitely an attempt. It was it was searching. It was searching for God. Um, the entire record, I think, is me searching for God mm. and um, not being able to find God, not being able to find a higher power. Um, during the time that I was making this record as well, I I was working um, twelve step program. I was working Coda and Alanon, um, and was trying to find a higher power in in those in that context. Um, and was having difficulty doing so. So um, the commune with God is is like a, is definitely a seeking and not finding, I think, mm. in the record. Mm. And, you know, I mean, uh, outside of sort of a musical context is, and, you know, barring the atheist statements that you made just a second ago, you know, is, is uh, uh, do you often find yourself, you know, attempting that communication in private moments as well? Like, is prayer generally something that is, you know, significant to you? Which, again, I ask, given just the intensity with which you try to make that, you know, communication on, on, on this record. Yeah, in... In my private life, I do not pray. Mm. Um, I, I started trying to pray, and I feel like I've lost that capability because I, I don't know, I prayed so often as a child mm. um, every day. Um, and I don't even know how anymore, mm. although I suppose the entire record is some form of prayer. Um, but I... Yeah, it's it it isn't really a part of my daily life at this point. Yeah. I, I guess um I'm just kinda curious given, you know, some of the Catholic background, uh uh because, you know, as somebody who was in the religion myself at, at one point, you know, I vividly remember um <clears throat> you know, uh, uh sort of the uh almost like the hierarchy of communication with God, which had to be done, you know, through the confessional as well, you know, and, and right. I sort of, you know, wonder if in the past, like, you know, was, was that something that you ever held issue with this idea that, you know, God, maybe in sort of a Protestant sense, wasn't more of like a, I guess, more of an intimate relationship. It was something that, you know, you sort of needed like a third party to be involved with to sort of act as sort of like, you know, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the mediator, the zoom call to reach God. Um, <laughs> You know, because you've, you've spoken before about uh, uh, being attracted to sort of like the pageantry of uh, religion and, and Catholicism and, and sort of, you know, and, and I guess I wonder as a result of that, like, what do you also simultaneously think of like the hierarchy that is also kind of involved with that as well? Because it, it does seem like you wrestle with that, too, on this record. Yeah, um, I think that's part of also the the kind of vernacular religious approach that I took in um, in this record of like the, the communication to God being direct, um, which I think is, is also a part of Amish and Mennonite um, and uh, certain forms of like, um, again, like vernacular religions out in, in Pennsylvania um, and that you don't need these kind of like structures that surround, for instance, Catholicism um 
and that you can speak directly to God. Um, that was something that I found really interesting. Um, and I think in a way, um, the site Pennsylvania kind of became God. And a thing that I really connected with out there was nature. Mm. And so I started to um, develop a really important connection with the natural world and a, with the kind of like sublime, I guess, out there. Um, and it was kind of like my comfort and my solace to be out in in God's country, like kind of among God um, in in nature, I think. And so that was kind of my direct link to maybe the higher power that I was seeking, that it was nature somehow. Hmm. I, I wanted to dig a little bit more specifically into some of the folk aspects of the record that turn up on a few mm -hmm. tracks because they do manifest in such an interesting and authentic way. I think like when you were in Pennsylvania and sort of familiarizing yourself with these, you know, communities, was there any sort of like, you know, a research or immersion that you had to sort of put yourself into in order to, I guess, get a better grasp of, you know, Appalachian folk music as like a sound and aesthetic and a style to be able to not only execute it on this record, but then also to kind of turn it into this, you know, very noisy and intense uh, sort of experience that very much, you know, reflects uh, uh, this, you know, what I guess some people might refer to as like a lingua ignota sort of sound. Mm -hmm. uh, I did do a lot of research. I, um, I read a lot and kind of picked up every book I could find on, on the Amish, on Mennonite Fracture, um, which is their illuminated manuscripts, um, on kind of the Pennsylvania Dutch culture. Um, and then I also did a lot of research into, um, you know, like televangelists, like I became really uh, kind of like bizarrely symbiotically enmeshed with Jimmy Swaggart um, and uh, in his work and started like just studiously watching his sermons and listening to all of his music. And um, and then also researching like the, the music of App Appalachia and like string bands and um, the history of certain instrumentation in that area. And I ended up just kind of like picking up instruments in antique stores and, you know, out in the world while I was there um, and utilizing them in the record, um, often in ways in which they're not supposed to be utilized or extended instrumentation or um, in a kind of experimental way. Um, but I, I was really um, musically, I became really focused on like on folk music, on melismatic music, which is part of what um, uh, Amish uh, singing and Amish uh, worship music is, is just melismatic chant that they set to like a, um, a popular hymn or something. So, um, so I started like really looking at uh, like hymns, psalms, uh, sung worship music of those areas and started applying the kind of um, the chord progressions and uh, the structures to to my own record in a sort of bizarre way. Mm. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'll say that you really kind of captured and I, I think sort of an important aspect to that style of music is really like a lot of the repetition involved in the tracks because it does sort of like really kind of create that transcendental experience. I, I don't really know what it is psychologically in the mind uh, that, you uh, uh, you know, creates this sensation. But uh, when you, you know, when you're hearing such an intense sound kind of repeated over and over and over and over and over, it does sort of like create almost like a buzzing kind of feeling in your head, which at, at, at a point where maybe people were less self-aware biologically, you could maybe connect to, I'm having a religious, I'm talking, I feel God in me or some shit like that. You know, it's right. a, I'm speaking in tongues. I'm sucking snakes heads off you know, that, that like that right. sort of Holy thing. Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. That was absolutely something I was thinking about. Um, and uh, that kind of that repetition um, is often used in like ceremony to um, 
to create a, a transcendental or hypnotic state, uh, which is meant to allow you to lapse into like um, religious fervor or ecstasy, um, at which point you will find like glossolalia and speaking in tongues and stuff. So, um, yeah, I was definitely keeping that in mind as, as structurally, at least as part of, you know, what I wanted to do. Uh, what, what you were saying earlier about Jimmy Swagger to uh, mm-hmm. jump into that as a connection quickly, um, you know, was, was that something that uh, you, you know, was that a threshold you crossed as a result of being in Pennsylvania at the time? Or was that just something that you kind of fell into as a result of, of, of some other kind of connection or, you know, happenstance? Um, well, Swaggart is not from Pennsylvania. This is kind of the only non-Pennsylvania, um, reference that I put (laughs) into the record. He's actually from Louisiana, uh, Baton Rouge. Um, but I was, uh, taken with his story of disgrace Mm. and, um, it had an interesting parallel in my life at the time. And so he became kind of an emergent figure, this kind of, uh, this, godlike figure who is worshipped by so many people and who presents himself um as godlike and you know um behind the scenes is you know being anything but godlike um and basically hypocrisy and um and so i came to him you know we were watching stuff about televangelists and i just started and about disgraced televangelists um, because it's kind of thing for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I really focused on him because he had a lot of material mm. and his confession is so, it's so like rich with like, it's just so gross. Um, and um, yeah, I was, I became really taken with him and I'm still taken with him. I still do work with, I've been making like a video series recently with like written pieces and video that are for Jimmy Swaggart. Um, and yeah, he's kind of the continuing thread for me. Yeah. No, I wanted to ask about that as well. If anybody's unaware on, um, you know, your band camp and Instagram, now you've been dropping sort of like these video montages and, you know, it's a lot of visuals from those Pennsylvania settings and it's, you know, letters that you've written and that you're speaking aloud, uh, to, mm-hmm. Jimmy, you know, uh, what did you feel like or what do you feel like those letters and those pieces sort of add to this album cycle? You know, after I mean, you know, at at least for me, the role that Jimmy plays as like a device for the record is is pretty clear and and pretty cut and dry. But after the record was over, what what did you feel like still was left to be said you know was was i i guess you know what what drove you to this point to can to put these letters out and what do you feel like they add to i guess like this era that you're in the midst of uh, artistically yeah um i just felt compelled to make them i um i first of all there was kind of a constraint um formally for me because i I was not able to sing this fall. I had a um, a tooth situation that I ended up having to cancel my shows and I canceled for other reasons as well, but mostly it was because I couldn't sing. So I was missing kind of my like major expressive outlet and I wanted to keep making things because I, feel, I constantly feel like if I'm not gonna make something, I'll, I'm like a shark, I'll die. Um, so, um, so I, I was trying to process the pain I was experiencing this summer and into this fall by writing these letters to Jimmy, um, who will never see them, who will never um, he- hear them or care. Um, and it was kind of this exercise in futility um, that, and in failure um, that felt really important for me to do at this time. And... Um, I don't know. I've, I've been wanting to move more into working in video. I directed uh, and shot um, the video for Pennsylvania Furnace. And so I, I've started kind of trying to integrate more disciplines into the, the lingua practice, I guess. And this felt like the way to, to continue into, you know, when I start recording again in the spring. Hmm. 
So, yeah. I, I wanted to ask about um, sort of another perception that you have of Jimmy and his inclusion in the record. I mean, maybe this is kind of answered uh, by what you were saying about him earlier and just sort of what you were referring to as kind of your, your spiritual evolution as a result of this record. But um, mm-hmm. when, when Jimmy is brought into the record or included into the record uh, to at least in one breath, like highlight some sort of hypocrisy, um, mm-hmm. you know, is it for you, is that done in a way that's, I guess, sort of like maybe in a way cynical, like, you know, sort of a burn it all down sort of attitude, like, fuck this shit. It doesn't mean anything like, you know, look at this bullshitter or whatever. Um, or is it also done in part to, you know, sort of acknowledge or maybe even like, you know, reinforce the Christian adage that like, we're, we're all fallen, we're all sinners. It doesn't matter how, you know, sort of like outwardly religious or a leader you are, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, uh, we're, we're all still sinners at the end of the day. Yeah, um, I wanted I wanted to make it ambiguous enough that both ways could be read. Mm. Um, that's the the narration of my music is really important to me, and that ambiguity of who is speaking and what they're actually saying is a, a really big part of my practice, and it harkens back to when I first started and I made the thesis, and the thesis was all other people's language. It was all um, misogynistic language that was processed and algorithmically generated and then became my language. Um, And so the narrator in my work is always ambiguous. It's always potentially me speaking, potentially my abuser, potentially God, or potentially the other figure. There's always the possibility that um, these people within the space of a line are speaking all together or all at once, or um, that, you know, when I'm using my voice, I'm actually speaking Jimmy's words. So um, I wanted, although there is like a very, yeah, I guess I wanted that that kind of ambiguity of like, indeed, you know, there is cynicism and hypocrisy, but also it speaks about the ways in which, you know, I'm, I'm talking about me as well when I'm talking about Jimmy. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely both for me. Mm. You, you referred to a second ago sort of there being a thesis for the record. Is 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 that in the case that like you you had to have a really clear idea as to what you were doing before you sort of you know embarked upon the journey to to do it um s- somewhat i was meaning more like the the thesis that started my project yeah. and the um from from back in the day and that there's this ongoing ambiguous narrator throughout the work um and um so But for this record, definitely there was, um, there was a general idea of what was going to happen. And there was obviously a lot of like structural and formal things that I was, that were kind of in like the, like the wheelhouse and the the toolbox and whatnot. But the record kind of evolved in a way that was different than the other records because I was living the experience of the record as I was making it. It wasn't you know, my previous records have been reflective and this one was about my current experience. Mm. Um, so it was building. It was a little bit different, honestly, this time. Mm. Um, to dive back into Pennsylvania for a second. I mean, it obviously like the, its inclusion manifests on the album in a bunch of different ways. But, um, you know, I'm specifically interested to hear how, you know, Centralia kind of ended up tying into the whole record because, I mean, you know, with Pennsylvania and Appalachia in general, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of lore, there's a lot of aspects that you could explore, but you decided to, you know, uh, make a large reference point, you know, sort of this town famous for this uh, mine fire that's currently burning under it and will probably, you know, continue burning for decades to come. And, it, you know, it was something that personally I wasn't completely unaware of, you know, prior. <laughs> and, um, you know, if anybody's, you know, interested in the story, I encourage you to look it up because it is, you know, really, I think one of the right. greatest American freak shows in, in modern history. Um, but, uh, you know, what attracted you to that story? What made you 
uh, stumble upon it and eventually, you know, sort of like include it in, in your work in such a bold way? Yeah. Um, so much of my time in Pennsylvania was spent kind of alone and um, trying to, with kind of nothing to do, kind of like stranded in COVID, um, isolated. And I kind of made it my objective to find out more about where I was living. And so I looked into a lot of the, a lot of the lore and a lot of the kind of weird sites of ruin and abandonment. There are many there. Um, there's also a really great spot, um, that was about 15 minutes away from where I lived, um, where I shot quite a lot of footage. Um, that was like an old iron ore facility. Um, that's just like big concrete blocks hanging out in the forest. Um, but Centralia is a very, is a pretty famous um, Pennsylvania site. And um, I had only driven through, I actually didn't go visit it and like stay there until very recently, like a month ago uh, when I was driving through. And, um, but I think it's such, like such a wild story. And it was so perfect for the record because it's just, um, I don't know, like, it's a perfect story of like dereliction and abandonment and this town that was doomed um, and where nothing can live anymore. And um, it really is just this site of like, there's nothing there. And there's a little bit of like steam and smoke that kind of um, can come through the seams in the asphalt, but everything that previously could live there can no longer, um, except for this crazy church that's up on a hill and it's perfect. Um, so it, it felt for me like kind of my interior, it, it became like a very personal place for me uh, to reference. And then to talk, you know, the, the title Perpetual Flame of Centralia has like kind of many meanings um, being, you know, literally about the, um, the underground fire burning continually. And then um, uh, potentially like a perpetual flame of, of, of adoration. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was so, it's so perfectly locked into to all the themes of the record. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when I was looking into it myself, that church is like one of the strongest kind of like reference points for the whole thing, because I think like its existence and just how virgin it looks is just kind of, mm -hmm. I think, a testament to our as a society, like our religious spirit and also superstition in a way yeah. like, you know, even if things are like completely like falling apart and whatever, that is a house of God. You don't touch it. It's sacred. It's whatever, you know, no matter what, you know, sort of religious background it comes from, like that's God's place. You don't do anything with it. You don't fuck with it. You know, it's sort of like right. reminds me of um, when I had gone to a, a couple of music festivals in Australia and uh, one of the venues that I had been to, I think in Melbourne uh, was this really cool rock venue that was converted from a church. So it's, you know, you go in there and it's like an old stone church as well. And um, you know, I, I, in the past, I've been to a few shows at like some religious, you know, uh, buildings. But like when I was in there, I was like, we would never do this here. Like this is, you yeah. know, to sort of just turn a church. Like if, if, if you end up not using the church for anything, you just leave it. Because like, again, because of, of, that, of that superstition, uh, because of, you know, the, the yeah. idea of like maybe even accidentally doing something sacrosanct in there and then it's sort of like coming back to to bite you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the European versus American um, perspective on uh, how we sanctify places and how we hold and preserve spaces of worship is very different. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, I guess sort of like the process of actually creating the album. Did you find yourself running into, I guess like any bumps or difficulties in, 
uh, the recording process or, you know, being able to sort of like maintain your vocal health, which, you know, vocals are always something that you're like running in the red on, on so many of your records and performances uh, when making this album? Yeah, um, for vocals, I, I made a very conscious decision to not really scream. Mm. And it was part of part of the entire, I guess, kind of the ideology of the record. And Seth and I talked about this in the beginning when we really sat down to discuss it. Um, Seth Manchester at Machines with Magnets, who is my uh, wonderful producer and engineer um, and my dear friend. Um, we were talking about how to create a record that's really dark and very noisy and very upsetting, um, but without using any of the previous conceits that I'd used really, um, or using distortion or using screaming and how we could use, you know, again, that kind of like Appalachian darkness um, to create a really upsetting soundscape without, you know, without actual distortion or without actual noise. Um, there's very, very little distortion on the record at all, if any. Um, but so I did not scream and I really leaned into and did a lot of research on how I wanted my voice to sound um, because it is a bit different than the previous records. And I wanted to, I listened to again, a lot of like folk, music a lot of appalachian music a lot of um you know again like mennonite and amish uh singing and i wanted that kind of conviction and rawness uh, and lack of refinement in my voice and so i really focused on kind of like unlearning a lot of classical technique which i already pretty much don't use in the project anyway because i'm using like a belt register um but taking taking away like the things about my voice that I think are beautiful and just having it be like very straight and focused and like about what I was saying mm. as opposed to focusing kind of on like creating a, a beautiful tone. Um, so there was a lot that was a challenge and it was a challenge to hear my voice and to be like, this sounds ugly. I don't want it to sound like this. Mm. Uh, I want reverb on it. Like I want it to be nice. And Seth would be like, no, it's, it's perfect. Uh, it sounds terrible. It's perfect. And there were a lot of moments that were like, um, legit, like uninhibited, bad pitch. Like I'm pitchy and there's, it's, I'm just pitchy and I didn't do a good job singing the note and we kept it because it's, it aligned with the, the ideology of the record and creating that kind of like, ugh moment, like, Oh God, like, why didn't they take that out? Like she's pitchy, but we kept it. So that was, it was challenging for me, like emotionally. Cause I'm like, Oh, I want it to sound, you know, my classical brain is like, this sounds like shit. I hate this. Um, but for, for our purposes, we needed to keep it, um, you know, ugly. Mm. So, um, other than that, like it was really smooth making the record. I think for the most part, um, Seth and I had no, fights about how I wanted things to sound or how he wanted things to sound. We like worked really happily on and um, not that we fight generally, but that like, you know, sometimes I fight him because I'm like, it needs to sound bigger. It needs to sound crazy. It's like, there's no blast beats. Like, um, so, so yeah, I was, I was very amenable to like making sure that it stayed within the confines of what it was supposed to be and did not try to do other shit that like Caligula would have done, for instance. Mm. So yeah, for me, that was the main challenge being like, I want it to be big. I want it to be beautiful. I want it to be like a massive, you know, production. And then instead keeping it like simple, you know, keeping like parts where I would have put like a billion polyphonic you know voices around me just keeping it one voice mm. um so yeah that was that was kind of the the challenges as far as as making no it's it's funny that you describe the vocals that way and you know the, i mean there is something raw about a lot of the singing on the record but um um I'd, I would describe it in a way I mean, I, I get where you're coming from, because I imagine sort of like doing each individual vocal sort of like in a harmony style and hearing you do it in the moment, especially during these tracks and passages where you're singing in like 
almost a higher register and have and bring your nose more into it sort of sort of like a maybe more of a sort of tone but like you know from the outside when i hear all those vocals sort of layered up on each other it sounds like a bunch of reed instruments like a bunch of very like tiny reed instruments Mm -hmm. sort of like droning together and it does again sort of like help create that buzzing transcendental sort of feel in in your head because it is something that um Again, I, I can't quite describe it, but it, it is a little like, you know, mentally a little scrambling. Yeah, that was that was definitely an objective. It was it was looking at, again, like those raw voices of Appalachia. And instead of like trying to replicate like the twang or any any kind of like. Um, um, any kind of like specific vernacular idiom, just taking like that that like focus and it is very like it's nasal i had to bring my voice out of out of my throat and out of like my soft palate and bring it like forward to um to achieve that sound which is i think you know one of uh for the song the sacred liniment of just of judgment um we worked really hard on eqing the voice to get it to sound as grating as possible and um that that track in particular like the vocals are just like so like eh, you know it's just like and uh like no no refinement whatsoever and uh basically just yelling mm-hmm. um and and then it eq'd in a way that it was like very like ooh, like very buzzy in in your head so um yeah that was very intentional i wanted to ask you also about the um I, I, if I could refer to it as your look for the record, um, you know, I feel like a lot of the visuals that you created around the Caligula era, uh, you know, especially with like the tattoo and everything were super purposeful in terms of like what you wanted to present visually. And a lot of this new cycle, uh, especially like revolved around those, you know, Ashley Rose couture sort of pieces that you were wearing that were. Um, very ornate and, uh, you know, like almost like thin in terms of the material and almost like, you know, veiling in a way like what, what, what do you feel like those, you know, pieces sort of like brought to the visual aspect of this record this time around and, and what made you, you know, sort of like in, incorporate that into the, uh, you know, records, uh, I guess, <laughs> greater universe as well. Right. Um, Ashley is such a, a genius. I don't know how she does what she does. I really think she's a visionary and I hope she gets just like massive recognition because she, I, in my mind, she's just as great as like a McQueen or a Vivian Westwood or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I knew her work and I wanted to work with her before she knew about me. I've had her like in my sights for quite a while and this was finally my opportunity. And um, starting with that mask, which is on the cover, um, which I took, which has like an element of like really perverse transgressive chastity to it and is almost like, it's like grotesque. Mm. And that's something that I really love about her work. It's like, it's so heavily wrought with like tool and pearls and beads. It's like, um, it's really overloaded with ornament. And I thought that was a really interesting and beautiful contrast to the kind of like Spartan nature of the music and the kind of Spartan nature and the derelict nature of Pennsylvania, Mm -hmm. that it was like incorporating an element of the sacred and sanctity in a way that was um, more like materialistic and more, um like yeah kind of more more material than than the record being so spiritual i guess mm. um for me it was like it was a really nice contrast was there anything that sort of went into the you know idea or philosophy behind maybe uh, like obscuring your face this time around on the album cover as opposed to you know, being so upfront with it on the last one, like, you know, sort of hiding in that way. Was, was that something that sort of adds to the narrative of the record for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, to me, I was thinking of it as like, 
because I think there are a lot of like sexual themes in the record um, that are more kind of explicit than my previous records. And I was thinking of it as like a gimp mask a bit, mm. like that it's this really like <laughs> crazy, um, ornate, beautiful, like chaste gimp mask. Um, and that I loved that. We, we I played with a few different ideas for the cover, but that one was the one that was just kind of like, it made sense. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that the next one will be some other kind of strange portrait. I'm not sure what it will be yet, but um, in, I wanted to keep, like, I want to keep the project consistent in certain ways. And I wanted to have it be a portrait, but I wanted it to be a kind of different portrait, I guess. Yeah. Like from all bitches to Caligula to this, it does seem like there is a very clear kind of visual consistency, but you're changing it up significantly with each one. Um, I I wanted to ask you with the way the sort of narrative concludes on the record, especially, uh, you know, with the final track, especially with what you were saying, you know, earlier about, um, you know, the atheism thing, um, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless of that, that track in particular does like really stand out as, I don't know, reaching some point of serenity or, you know, after all of the trials and tribulations of the record so far, um, maybe you did sort of find what you were seeking because, you know, you talked so much about, you know, the act of seeking on this record and then creating the record. Um, you know, what, was that something that was actualized on that track? You know, did, did you feel like you reached a point of solace or serenity or was that just like, <laughs> I have to end this album in some way. So it's, you know, maybe a positive note, like, you know, what, what was, what was the, <laughs> you know, I guess the philosophy behind that track in general, and did that actually, you know, the, the tone of the song lyrically reflect in any way for you personally, in terms of your experience of making the record? Yeah, the, the last song was very intentional in a few different ways. Um, first of all, it, I wanted to make sure that I wanted the narrative of, the, of this record structurally and as far as the storytelling to do something different than Caligula did. Um, and to, because Caligula is very much like a circle um, and is, is a cycle. And I didn't want to do the same thing again. I wanted to have a different kind of arc and uh, I guess like shape to the record. And um, so I was thinking about <laughs> And it was a controversial thing for me because I was like, oh, we have to, again, like with Seth, I'm just like, we have to make it big. We have to make it like Caligula. It has to be huge. Um, and and Seth was like, no, like we leave this like incredibly vulnerable, sad song at the end um, to close out the entire thing. And the last thing you hear is the piano pedal raising. And you're like, is that it? Um, but for as far as the storytelling in the record, I think that song is about defeat. I think that song is about surrender and defeat. And um, it throws, like, it has essentially like a totally traditional psalm or hymn form. Um, And then it it throws like a little bit of a curveball with the lyrics of like, um, what the, what are the fucking lyrics? Jesus Christ. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um ugliness my home loneliness my master i bow to him alone and so it's just kind of like oh that sucks it's so sad um but that was how i wanted to i wanted to close the, the record on this very like quiet vulnerable like singular moment of like perhaps like perhaps serenity but you know surrender essentially and you know, acceptance, I think, hmm. was the was the tone I was going for. Yeah. And, and, you know, to speak to sort of the grandiosity of the song in general, I mean, I, I think that was certainly achieved through all the vocal layering and the, you know, gospel aspects and especially the horns, um, which, uh, you know, uh, again, just kind of reminded me, as, as you say, of sort of like a hymnal. And, you know, you talk about sort of like giving up on the track and defeat, but, you know, in, in a way after a record like this is, is that, is, is there like a finality to that or sort of like, um, maybe a break in tension for you with that? Because at least if I've given up, then I'm not like continuing to fight against the fucking tide that's beating me every time I try to push against it. Because, you know, as, right. as you say, it does feel like there's sort of like a solace in maybe yeah. not trying. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. It's um, again, it's meant to be ha to have that kind of like ambiguity of um, uh, of intention a little bit that it could be seen as, you know, like total defeat and acceptance, but also that it could be seen as like, you know, this is the end. This is kind of like the, the final tone and it is what it is. Mm. And, um, yeah, I think that, I think that there are a few possible reads there. Um, and that, that again was, was intentional. And again, the, the horns was also a very intentional move. We had Ryan Seaton, who's amazing. Um, do all of, a lot of the horn arrangements and woodwind arrangements and everything most a lot of the instrumentals and um we wanted to stay away from female vocals with strings that was like a big like original i play like the cello really terribly in an extended or prepared fashion on one of the songs but we couldn't put the cello anywhere else uh, anywhere else because it was just it fit into that like uh, cliche of like woman sad strings we wanted it to be like woman very bizarre instrumentation and so the horns instead of like having a string arrangement you know it would have sounded like you know Lana Del Rey or something no offense to her she's you know fantastic in her own way but like that it um it has like a very specific like funeral sound mm. um like a almost like a New Orleans funeral or something um so yeah, that was very intentional as well. No, that's, that's a great uh, point in terms of like the, you know, geographical or cultural inspiration there. And, and now I'm just thinking of like music listeners and fans who are like most definitely on like the lingua Lana Del Rey, like spectrum. I've, I've definitely like seen like a few pro lingua tweets from like a, a Lana Del Rey PFP account or two, you know? So it's like, there's, <laughs> there's definitely, there's definitely like some crossover there for sure. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, before we, uh, uh, you know, head out about something, you know, uh, very serious, uh, that we, you know, had, uh, uh, discussed for a moment prior about, um, some tweets that you had, uh, put up recently that make some pretty serious and, and damning allegations against, um, daughter's front man, Alexis Marshall. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, there are allegations of abuse and, uh, uh, this is something that you have been, um, you know, given the timeline, like dealing with for a long time and, and holding in for a while as well, um, you know, at least sort of like in a social media, you know, sense, like what made you want to come out and sort of like speak about that? And I guess like spell it out in the way that you did now at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, the truth, mm -hmm. um, I wanted the truth. Um, I, wrote the record about this experience. Um, that's what it's about. Uh, that's the document for me. And, you know, I was in an, an abusive relationship with this man for two years. I was emotionally abused. I was mentally abused. I was sexually abused. Um, one incident of sexual abuse led to me needing surgery on my spine, which my fans helped me pay for. Um, and to my fans, I want to say like, thank you because you didn't know that you were helping me in that way. And you did. Um, and there's a lot more I could say about the situation, but for now I'm trying to heal and trying to process a lot of trauma. Um, it's not easy. I left that situation like a fucking hole in the floor. I was nothing. I was, I'd been reduced to like essentially servitude of this person who, um, didn't care about me. And yeah, I, um, I'm just trying to heal. And it's important to me that the truth is out there and that my truth is out there. Um, because unfortunately this behavior predates me by quite a bit. Um, and it's not just me. And, um, I don't know. Yeah. And I can, only, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, well, I was going to say just for clarity on that timeline, like that surgery that you refer to, you had that just before we had our first interview. And I did. at that time, I believe, you know, you had told me like, 
it was from some long standing health issue or something that you had you had been dealing with. So you know you were you weren't even forthright with it around around that time. So this is something that you've been you know sort of like working through for a while. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I could I couldn't say what happened. Oh, no. I, I understand. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's. Um, it's been brutal. Um, and it's been brutal to like pretend that I'm happy when I'm not and to put on a happy public face when I'm not happy and when I'm being devalued, um, in so many different ways. Um, and it's not to say that I'm a saint or like a paragon of virtue. Um, but I didn't deserve to be abused by this person and, um, he's going to do what he's going to do, but I have to focus on myself and my healing. Um, and, you know, I think at some point I will speak in greater detail about it, but it has to be when I have processed what's gone on. Um, and there's been a lot, you know, as you saw, like my statement is 7,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah as, as of right now, I mean, obviously you're still working through all of this. What, what does, you know, uh, in an ideal situation, closure on this, uh, look for, look like, you know, for you, does it sort of like, you know, end at sort of putting your experience out there and eventually letting just kind of time run its course and, and moving on? Or is there, you know, uh, something else beyond that, that you hope to achieve or happen to reach again, some point of closure or accountability for all of this? <laughs> it's so tricky. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we deal with these situations? Mm. Um, how, how do we culturally deal with this shit? It's impossible. It's, it's a no win situation kind of any way you look at it. It's not about like canceling someone's band. It's not about asking anyone to not listen to daughters or, you know, it's about this person's behavior is unacceptable. And what do we do about it? You know, uh, I can't control Alexis. I don't have any control over him. Um, I don't have any control over anything except myself and my own healing. So while accountability would be nice, I can't expect it. I can't put my healing on hold hmm. waiting for that. Um, for initially, I thought I did. I thought I required, you know, an apology, but you're not going to get it, you know? So ideally there would be change in the way that we deal with these situations and there would be change in people's behavior and there would be change in the way that we approach our communities and the ways in which we keep women safe in our communities and vulnerable people safe in our communities and abuses of power in our communities. Um, ideally like that would be something constructive would come from something like this. And I'm hoping to find a way to help support other survivors and, um, that is more concrete than just having the cathartic outlet of the music. I'd like to find something. Um, so I don't know. It's all, you know, the world we live in is kind of fucked mm -hmm. and dealing with this stuff in a public forum is incredibly difficult. It's not, and it's not fun for me to like come up here and say this and then expose myself to potentially further abuse and further objectification from people I don't know. Um, so I don't know. It is what it is. Well, just to say personally, I do admire, you know, your strength and your straightforwardness on this and, you know, obviously your ability to move through it and just speak on it as well. And, um, uh, and, and I, you know, I thank you and I appreciate you for, you know, doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I'm also very happy with how our conversation played out generally. I, you know, uh, continue to treasure you as, you know, a, a, an artist and a creator and just, a you know, just an artistic mind in general. And, uh, you know, I think this new record has just been a showing of your power and your vision and just, uh, you know, everything that, uh, you know, you've been working up to to this point is manifested in such a great piece of work. And I hope that, you know, you can, in the midst of all of this, feel proud of yourself, you know, after all this, because yeah. it's really good. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
all right, well, I'm going to have to hit you up when you drop your next record. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for having me again. No, thank you for coming through. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, you know, come hang with us and be so open about everything. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. You've been great. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night.